Oče Stefane, dora hromado, dori člane tosu, Hristos narodevsi. So we waited until this this point in time because we actually had sent out invitations to all the parishes and Edmonton as well. But on behalf of Miroslav Opet, who is the Holova of Tus Edmonton branch, we're pleased that you are here with us and we're happy that you're here with us. Um, we have a short presentation, uh, hopefully it's short, in terms of uh, myself. I'm going to talk about the election in Ukraine in Octo on October the 28th and Yaroslav is going to talk about Ukraine today just to give you a little bit of a perspective. Those of you that don't know, I have been to the elections in Ukraine since 2004, December, where I was sent to Donetsk in 2006, Mykolaiv. In 2007, I chaired the International Observers Committee for UCC, and I was stationed in Kiev. In 2010, January, I was in Lviv. In 2010, February, I was sent to Cherkasy. And in 2012, I was selected as an international observer, a long-term observer, and I arrived in Ukraine on August the 30th and didn't come home until November the 1st of 2012. And let me tell you, that was quite an experience. All those other times I was in Ukraine, they were actually very, very meaningful to me as well, too. But uh, this was a, a whole different, different game. I also realized that I was a member of a very important mission and as such I was also representing Canada and I could not compromise the mission in any way. There was a zero tolerance policy with regard to serious violations of the code of conduct. In previous elections we were just a little bit too overly aggressive, we were too much uh, one-sided, we just didn't follow the rules, we broke conduct and so forth. And we were actually following international observer rules when we were at the election. We also had a discussion on the use of language in Ukraine. I'm a fluent Ukrainian speaker and my team partner, Kim Hausen, is fluent in Russian. A decision was made at the key level in Kiev that all of our discussions at the ground level in Dnipropetrovsk and all across Ukraine were going to be in English. We had translators, we also had a driver, the translators would translate for us. One of the biggest problems that we, we, that we saw when we were there was that they actually labeled us um, in different ways. And one of the ways they would label us as being sub, subservient is if we, didn't, if we started speaking them in Ukrainian and the other person didn't speak Ukrainian, they would actually go to the Ukrainian speaking one all the time. And so we didn't want to have this first rate, second rate kind of long term observer. And so that was the reason why we did it all in English. They were quite pleasantly surprised when I started speaking to them in Ukrainian and Kim started speaking to them in Russian. And this happened right across Ukraine. Another very important point that was uh, stressed by the, uh, to the LTOs and later on to the short-term observers was that our job was to observe and record. We were not there to make judgment calls. We were there to observe the situation, take pictures. Our record team in cave were going to analyze all of that information. Because in a sense, what happened in Dnipropetrovsk in one city and one Gilnetsia didn't mean it was happening all over Ukraine. But if cave got information that this same situation was occurring in 50, 60 different spots in Ukraine, they could say that it is a, an election problem. And so we, we would always respond, because I, I was actually asked to go on television and be interviewed and so forth. I said, well, you can interview me all you want, but you're going to get nothing from me. And then Hafi just walked away. But um, we were just basically saying the Mission Canada is an independent observer mission team funded entirely by the government of Canada, which is here to support a free and electoral cycle. And the preferred outcome for us is a free will of the Ukrainian people and that it is heard. So my frame of reference as well as a long-term observer was to perform election observation duties in the designated area, and mine was Dnipropetrovsk. And to do that, we were there eight, uh, eight weeks before the actual election, and that was really meaningful because when the short-term observers arrived in cave on October the 20th, we actually had a plan of action for them 
where we would send them in our different areas and so forth. And the second big thing was to prepare all necessary logistical requirements for the deployment and election observation mission of the short-term mission under the supervision of and in coordination by Mission Canada. Dnipropetrovsk is a huge area. It's 500 kilometers south of Cave. You can travel there by car in five hours. The roads are excellent. One of the very few roads that are excellent. When we arrived there, we were met by our drivers and our translators. There were two teams there. My task as a long-term observer in Dnipropetrovsk was to observe the performance of election commissions, that's the district election commissions, and the precinct election districts. To observe election campaigning, we focused on the main parties, even though there were many, many other parties. In particular, the party of regions, Bakyushna, Udar, Svoboda, Communists, Ukraine Forward, and our Ukraina. We also attended political rallies in our area of deployment to observe how they were going on. We observed the situation of civil and political rights with regards to campaigning and voting. We observed and we met with journalists and observed the regional media coverage to see that it was free from undue pressure. We attended and observed uh, election disputes and court cases. We observed freedom from intimidation. Observed freedom of access to polling stations by voters. Met with local and state government officials as well as with security forces within each region that we were deployed. And in most cases, this was the first thing that we attempted to do. And when we were in Kipro Petros, the governor, the governor general, the general of the, of the, of the, of the Dnipro Petrovsk offered us two plainclothes policemen to accompany us everywhere so that we could be safe. We declined the invitation because we said we're international observers, we have to be neutral. This does not bode well. And the last thing we did was we met with international observers in our region, NMO, OSC, ODIR, and we established positive working relationships with them and later on with the American Embassy and so on. Because this, again, is so large, my group, Kim and I, we were responsible for nine, nine um, district election commissions, and the other group was responsible for eight. In our nine district election commissions, there were 1,021 precinct election commissions. We couldn't see them all. For each one, we were able to create a series of questions that would help us resolve and answer some of those questions that I just was telling you about. And we observed how they acted with us and how they did things. The days were quite long. We would be on the road with a specific agenda by 9 a.m. and we would return by 6 p.m. We would then write our long reports for another three hours, be prepared for a report for CAVE, and then head to sleep by 11 o'clock. The interim reports that came out, the first one and the second one, were really, really important, and they were based, and you all read them all if you had a chance to look at the website. They were, um, they were uh, created because of the reports that I and all the other long-term observers sent to CAVE. When, when, we, when we finished our work in, in, as long-term observers by October the 20th, I had met with the governor's office, of, uh, the mayor of Dnipropetrovsk, the mayor of Zenilkivka, um, Dnipropetrovsk chief of police, Dnipropetrovsk city police, the political parties that I just mentioned many times, election commissions from September the 3rd to October the 19th, there were a total of, of 39 visits. So. On many occasions, we would revisit and meet with up with them and so forth. They were always welcome to see us there. We also visited 74 precinct elections between October the 1st and October the 18th. And those are the elections, those are the precinct elections is where they were actually, people were actually going to vote there. And they had to set everything up. We, we wanted to make sure that everything was fine. And, and in the end, things did look really quite well. We visited the local non-government officials, OPORA, Committee of Voters. There were the two domestic observer groups. And they've trained and sent out long-term observers within Ukraine, and they registered many short-term observers for the election. The international observer missions, uh, ANIMAL, OSCE, U.S. Embassy, Moldavian Embassy, European Exchange, and European Parties that were run by the Polish, German, and Latvian members. And they're interesting because 
Um, they actually all have international standards. And at first, they're not willing to talk to me because they felt we didn't have that. But as time went on, they began to see evidence that we actually were following the normal rules for international observers. And they, they became friendlier with us, and we shared a lot of information, and we were able to, to get help that way. The work that we did, observations and meeting with many different groups in India was both rewarding and challenging. There were many positive results. Individual party members, candidates, election district members, journalists, and many others trusted us. And, um, and we did not waver from our purpose and task was assigned to us. We received many phone calls from these individuals and in many cases they were leading us to some trouble spots and felt that we should be there to observe the event. Questions were always answered that we posted to all the interest groups. In general, we had a very positive experience leading up to the arrival of the short-term observers. The analysis from the, um, that the core, Canada core mission team sent to you in, 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 in the first report and the second report were interesting too because it had an impact in Ukraine. I know for a fact that when I was in Dnipropetrovsk, the only signs that were up, the posters of, that were up were actually for the party of regions. They would not allow anybody else to uh, put anything up for fear of uh, destroying the companies and so forth. So they actually told the companies, if you put up any, any other posters, we will destroy your company. And that's really against the sort of the whole democratic purpose of having elections. Once this, these reports came out, we began to see posters and big billboards in Dnipropetros that had all the parties in it. But in those reports, they, they, they were presented to numerous complaints filed with the courts by DEC members, election, electoral contestants, and official observers that challenged the vi wide variety of actions and inactions and decisions of the DEC. The Ukrainian legal framework established an overly complex formalistic process for adjudication for the election related complaints and appeals and to a certain degree, to a certain degree it undermined access to justice. In the manner in which election disputes had been handled by the CEC and courts have not been in full accordance with transparency, due process and the law. There was also concerns about restrictions on media freedom, harassment of journalists and general lack of pluralism. When we were talking with the journalists, they said, well, I can write all the reports that I want, but nothing's going to get published. But if I want to get things published, if I follow the party line, they will publish it. That's not journalism. That's not free journalism. There was also evidence of indirect vote buying, limited access to advertising on TV, radio, billboards, and other printed material, black PR, and that was negative campaigning. That was simply saying, this candidate is doing such and th such and such a thing, and that's called black, even though that's not true. And you actually had their voices that they actually somehow put together, and they were saying negative things. Uh, human rights violations, the use of police against activists, campaign volunteers, protesters were also troubling. Candidates had been harassed, intimidated, and beaten. And there was this administrative resource abuse where they were saying that the party of, uh, of regions and the candidate actually put up that the, the, the playground, when in fact the playground was put up by the government at that particular time using government resources. The government happened to be the party of regions in control there, but you can't say that. And there's also the gender issue. Women were, are unrepresented, underrepresented as candidates for office and most regional parties have between 10 and 20 percent representatives from women in the top 10th of the party list and there's only 2 percent that actually women in their Verkhondarada. When we arrived in Kiev, uh, when the short-term short -term observers came, I was then promoted, in that another job, to divisional leader and in that particular case I had another job to do. I had to take care of not only Dnipropetrovsk but Zaporizhia and Kharkiv. And one, the biggest job that I had with that was to make sure that all were safe. We were always worried. The ambassador from Canada was worried about that, and we were all worried. There were a number of problems that we resolved very, very quickly, and yet to act on it immediately. There were two major reporting procedures, the quantitative. The SDOs had to write a comprehensive report and they had to actually phone their information to the, to the core team. So in the end, the core team had information immediately. 
and the qualitative, that was my job, I had to report the findings that I received from my, my group leaders and I had to present that to the core team on election day. So on election day, I was in my apartment. I was busy writing these different reports, getting information from all of my short-term observers through the group leaders. And I finished my final report at 4 a.m. in the morning and uh, proceeded to go to sleep. And then I got up at 8 o'clock in the morning and spent another five hours watching them count the votes further. When we, were, when we arrived back at, in CAVE, it was interesting, too, because uh, we knew there were lots of problems. The, the head of mission emphasized that this was a historic mission. Our purpose was to observe and record our findings, um, send the information to, to, the, to the group, to the core group, and then the Canada mission will complete the final report for the Canadian government. As Senator Andrzejczyk said, as, as she said that Taras Zaluski, who was uh, Can Mission Canada's chief of staff, spoke to it in a different way. He said, yes, it, is, it, was, it was a historic mission, but we had 65 long-term observers in the field. We had 422 short-term observers. Division leaders across Ukraine number seven. Group leaders in Ukraine number 38. Kilometers traveled by the short-term observers, the long-term observers were 1,309,000 kilometers. Daily reports, 857. Precinct election districts visited 5,450, that's out of 33,000. DECs visited 186 out of 225. Calls to the call center, 21,000. Votes, votes cast by October the 31st, 58%. Incident reports, 97. And the Canada mission was a massive logistical project that was very, very successful. In the end, the party of regions, there were two, two ballots. The first ballot was for uh, individual candidates, and the second ballot was for an overall. And so in the single mandate districts, the party of regions won 113 seats, but Kyushina 39, Svoboda 12, Udar 6, United Center 3, People's Party 2, Soyuz one seat, and Radicals one seat, and then Independents got 43 seats. So that was, that was a big, big change. In terms of the national vote, there's three parties, five parties. Party of Regents got 72% there, but Hushna got 62 seats. Udar, for the first time, got 34 seats. The Communists remained still in there at 32 seats, and Svoboda got 25 seats for a total of 225. The general conclusion after the election on October the 29th, on October the 29th was democracy in Ukraine has taken a step backward since Yanukovych was elected in 2010. This is a statement from OSCE. In certain uh, aspects, the election also fell short on international standards and there were some irregularities, a number of areas which undermines a fair election. On the other hand, Canada's head of mission, Senator Andrejciuk, stated that this does not mean that the election is invalid. The observed irregularities and, and in and of themselves do not necessarily impede a free and democratic expression of the will of the Ukrainian people. However, the environment in which these elections were held underscores the fact that election day is but one piece of a large process that includes important legal and structural factors equally important to election fairness. And so, in the end, the way they set up the election was, you could have said, it could have been set up so that the party of regions could win. But the party of regions did not get a clear majority. And so there is that difficulty. So they also were worried about the cumulative effect of multiple factors in the broad electoral process leading, leading our mission to, a preliminary con to, to preliminarily conclude that Ukraine's parliament parliamentary election fell short of meeting international standards in some significant respects. And again, I say some. They must be noted and they should be remedied. And these factors were the imprisonment of leading opposition figures, structural advantage of by the governing, governing party. See, in Canada, when the, when, the, when the election is called, the government is suspended. Nothing happens. You have the government officials that are working, but not the party, not the elected officials. There, the elected officials still meet. Lack of effective recourse and appeal for perceived injustices, 
questionable practices in the delineation of electoral districts. We had one electoral district that had to go to go at the, on election day after the ballots were taken 300 kilometers, way too far. Use of administrative resources to assist the governing party, insufficient financial reporting, requirements to allow voters and civil societies to follow the flow of money backing campaigns, insufficient transparencies in the election administration, inequitable access to representation on district and precinct elect electoral districts, um, and it goes on, failure to bring electoral offenders to justice. But there were also, what we noted were, there were positives. There's the establishment of a centralized permanent voter registry. And that was assisted by the Canadian government and the American government a number of years ago. Civil society groups have been able to organize effectively and to mobilize significant domestic scrutiny of the electoral process. The local precinct officials have demonstrated a general ability to competently administer polling stations and the field of candidate and parties is pluralistic resulting in no shortage of choices. So um, we're still waiting for the um, yards and are still waiting for the actual final report that's going to come from Canada. We don't have it yet. So we're looking, we're looking forward to see that um, yards that has not come out yet as far as you know. No. And we were told, yeah, we were told to keep quiet about what we saw there and so forth and we're waiting for that. But as Yaris says, when we were speaking about this the other day, that was October the 28th. Today is uh, February the 2nd. A lot of has changed. Parliament has started uh, in Parliament as well too. They opened up on December the 12th. There was a big fight in Parliament because two of the candidates from Batkivshina wanted to go to the Party of Regions. They blocked that kind of thing. They said you can't do that kind of thing. Then they started getting into fisticuffs. And somebody was saying in the international area, that's normal for Ukraina, that's normal for their parliament. It's not normal. It isn't. There's no question about that. Um, and they just wouldn't let these, uh, these two individuals in. So there was that problem of people saying one thing and doing another. Their feeling is that if you're from uh, Batyushna, you should stay as Batyushna because that's how you got elected, period. And it just isn't fair. So there's lots of, lots of work that has to be done there.